And so it's a delight to have him here today. Will you please welcome back to Cornerstone Church, my friend, Pastor Steve Holt. Okay, who wants to grow in here? Anybody want to grow? I don't know who did the graphics here. Was that, did you guys do that for me or do y'all, is that kind of your standard graphics? You did it for me. Come on, Sam. That looks like Colorado. I just noticed it. This took me three services to figure this out. But it's amazing. Um, you know, I just came from 7,000 feet and, um, and it's like, I don't know what you guys are, maybe a couple hundred feet or whatever, you know, on the East Coast, but like, I've had so much energy. I've been like fired up because like I went from 7,000 to like 100. I've got oxygen, man, come, coursing through my veins. The problem is I got to go back. And so I'm going to go back and I'm going to be lethargic for the first three days during, I mean, Thanksgiving already makes you lethargic, right? Because of the turkey and everything, you know? And so, so I've got everybody coming in. We have seven kids, okay? They range from 35 to 18. And they're all coming back. So I got two in the Atlanta area. I've got one in D.C. And then the others are there. And so they're all coming in, you know, and like Liz is just, she's like loving it. She loves that. But we've got, we've got to retrofit the house now. Because think about it. We, we bought a 1,200 square foot house. And then we added 1,000 square feet. Then we added another 1,000 square feet. And then we added a 2,000 square feet. So it went from 1,200 to 5,100 square feet over 30 years. Okay. So, so now you got empty rooms. So now we're going room by room and we're just like tearing them apart. Like we go in there and, and, and Liz can envision stuff, man. I mean, she's like an interior designer and it like, it totally just like overwhelms me. I have to leave. But she called me last night and she's sending me pictures and everything. This is, you, you guys are awesome. Let me just say, you, guys, we tend to draw the lines, but the women, they color in it, man. And they put beauty on it. So she does that, you know, and she makes it beautiful. Well, here's the deal. If I make my next appeal to you and I make it to the men, I know what'll happen because I know men, okay? So I'm gonna make this appeal that's actually to the women. So I, we've, we're, we're selling our, our swag and our books and stuff. And the less we take back, the better because we brought it here for you guys. So I've signed these two books. This is a study guide that goes with my book. So if there's a woman in here that wants your man to read this book, run up here and it's yours. First one up gets it. Oh, she gets it. You had a little blockage right there, you know? So in Colorado Springs, we have people who speed. We have, we have speed demons and, and, uh, and, and they do it in the snow and it's not very fun. I'll just tell you that right now. I've, I've never had an accident um, in my truck, and I've, and I've been in some gnarly situations with, uh, with snow and everything, and I, it's, a, it's a grace of God. But this guy, he was speeding, you know, and he got pulled over, and the cop comes up, and as he's walking up, he looks in the back window, and he sees machetes. And so, you know, every cop who goes up on a speeding ticket or something like that gets a little bit concerned, because that's where actually one of the most dangerous things you can do as a cop. So he comes up, and he says, hey, what's with the machetes? He says, oh, I'm a circus performer. I, uh, I juggle machetes. And he goes, really? He says, yeah, well, show me. So he comes out. He says, well, give me a machete. So he's flipping it. Give me two, flipping it. Three, juggling it. Four, juggling. Five, six, seven. He's going between his legs, and he's going behind his back, right there on the side of the road in his, in his car. And this guy drives by, and he says, I got to quit drinking. The roadside tests are getting a lot harder. And I don't know how many of you feel like that your life is almost like juggling machetes. But I'll tell you this, if you've got kids, you know what I'm talking about. And before that, if you got married, you know what I'm talking about. And let me just say, I think it's always better to wish you were married, but you're not, than to be married and wish you weren't. And so life is hard. Life is difficult. It's got challenges. It's got struggles. It's got things in our life that are that are creating fear in you. Fear is the enemy's best tactic to take you down. Social media, 24-hour news aren't making things any better. From pharmaceutical ads to quick fix infomercials, the media traffics in fear. It sells and we're buying. The rapid increase in depression is at an all-time high. The National Institute of Health, NIH, has found that over 21 million Americans struggle with some form of depression, with youth between the ages of 18 to 25 years old being the most frequent victims. People of all ages are suffering from panic, agoraphobia, 
social and separation anxiety disorders. The mental health and counseling systems, men and women, is overloaded. Suicide in all age groups have exponentially increased over the past few years. Newsweek magazine records that suicide is the highest since World War II. I was with the mayor and his assistant a few weeks ago, and I said to him, I said, his name is Yemi. Yemi is from Kenya, I believe. I said, Yemi, what do you think is the two biggest problems in our city? And he said, mental health and fear. And that fits with the national average. So that's probably true in this area. That's probably true with a lot of you in this room. If you are honest, you're dealing with some mental health issues. If you're honest, you're dealing with depression. If you're honest, you're dealing with areas of anxiety that you're not sure what to do about. Because what's happening is that we've got a culture that is externally putting pressure on you, especially if you're a Jesus follower. But internally, you're, you're trying to process. I mean, things are happening and so rapidly changing that it's difficult to know how to process it all. Does anybody feel a little fractured sometimes? Like you can't believe this is happening in your school or you can't believe this is happening with your kid or you can't, have, you can't believe that they posted that on you know, a, a news network. So that's kind of the world we're living in. And what do we do? Well, I'm gonna tell you that there's an answer and it's really, really simple. It's a simple answer with a complex solution. And it's Jesus telling us what he would do if he was here. So if, if you went in and you got, okay, you got a counselor over here, you got a mental health expert over here, and you could go in and Jesus was your physician, this is what he would write, it's his prescription. He would say, if you do this one thing, this main thing, and make it the first thing, it will actually heal almost every problem in your life. Okay, so turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Because in Matthew chapter 6, the greatest sermon ever given, even, even secular experts would say this is the greatest speech ever given, Matthew 6. And by the way, I'm a physical Bible guy, okay? So, so you can use your phones. I don't use phones. I, tell, I told the guys this weekend, quit using your phones because you guys look at sports scores. I know what you do <laughs> because I do. And in, in Georgia won yesterday. I want everybody to know that. I'm a University of Georgia grad, okay? Number one in the nation. Hello. Okay. So Matthew 6. So he's talking about 2,000 years ago, the same dilemma that we have right now. Different circumstances, same dilemma. Every one of you in this room struggles with worry. And here's how he starts. Verse 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. This is Jesus, Dr. Jesus. Dr. Jesus says, do not worry about your life. And then he gives an explanation to try to kind of hone in on what he's saying. What you will eat or what you will drink. I know none of you came in here thinking about lunch. Isn't that great? That's so beautiful about Cornerstone people. You guys come in, you're so focused. You're so for Jesus and everything. You're not, you didn't think about lunch or anything. I did, and I'm the speaker, okay? So therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to your stature? Now, I've always been short, okay? So I was short in first grade. I was short in third grade. I swore there's gonna be a growth spurt in fifth grade, but I was short in fifth grade. And then I thought by the time I'm a freshman at Georgia, University of Georgia, I'll, I'll, I'll put, I'll, I knew some people that grew in college. No, I didn't. So he's saying, look, your chances of, being able to biologically even worry yourself into getting taller is ridiculous. So why do you worry? What does worry do? What does it accomplish? What, 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 what do you gain from that? It's the same. He's saying, he's saying it's a metaphor for life, you guys. Think about your height. Think about your, your looks. You can't worry yourself into good. Well, I guess you can. Okay, there's some nip and tuck you can do, okay? But, but generally speaking, you can't, okay? So he's not done with this because he's like, they're not getting it. Even 2,000 years ago, they weren't getting it. So why do you worry, verse 28, 
about clothing. And I know none of you shop online or anything like that. You don't, you don't fret over clothes. That's so good. I mean, I just love this church. I, I can just see it. That's not a worry of yours. He didn't say you shouldn't shop. So, okay. So he said, don't worry about it. Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you of little faith? Now, so I have this, I have this house up in the mountains, okay? And I go there and I fly fish or we do ski weekends, different things like that. And I've got this book that is old photos from the 1890s into the turn of the century, 20th century, that shows that people came from all over the world to Colorado in the 1890s as the trains and stuff were developing to go up and see wildflowers. They, the wildflowers are f- phenomenal in Colorado, you guys. Uh, really about around August. August is the best time, in my opinion, at about 12,000 feet and above. 10,000 feet is good too, but 12,000 is even better. And I hunt and I fish, and so I, I love that. He's saying as beautiful as that is, that is so short-lived. I just do that just to, just to bless you guys with my beauty. You're so much more valuable than that. You're so much more valuable. I care way more about you than the lilies of the field. I care way more about you than anything else because you are the imagio dei. You are the image of God created by me. Do you, don't you think if I can take care, if I can make, and have you guys ever, ever looked at a wildflower? Maybe not, but if you, if you look at a wildflower, it's so intricate. It's so beautiful. It's five minutes, man. I mean, it's only there for like a month and then they're dead. And yet he did that just to beautify our earth. How much more does he want your life to be beautiful, successful, effective, prosperous, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. That's his point, but he's not done. Therefore, verse 31, do not worry. It was the third time he said that. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And then this is the thing. This is the operable sentence. This is the greatest sentence of the New Testament. Arguably by psychologists today, and I study psychology. I love psychology. Psychologists to say, I don't even have time to tell you all the, all the psychologists say, this is the greatest statement ever made. Secular. They're not even Christian. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things that you're fretting over, worried about, will be added unto you. Hello? That's the greatest news ever given to humankind, that if you will make the primary, the most noble cause of the universe, your primary, and your most noble cause, I'll take care of the secondary. I will take care of the secondary in your life. I will transform you from the inside out and you will become a new person. This one thing. And so this is Jesus writing a recipe. He's writing a prescription. I just got a tooth extract, okay? Ugh, bad news, man. I'll tell you, if you guys have got the alloys like all of us do with all the fillers that they put in your teeth, what happens is your teeth breathe. You may not know that, but your teeth do breathe. And then, the, and then the mercury that's in the, the, the metals that they put in starts to crack your tooth. So when you hit about my age, you're going to start having cracked teeth like her you. So if you can get them out now and put something natural in, way better. Anyway, I've got this thing right now, right? So I feel that thing. I can feel it in there because I'm missing a tooth right now because they haven't put the implant back. They haven't put an implant in yet. The reality is this, guys. Your body even in a kingdom way, is made to heal itself. So when I was with the doctor and I'm looking at him, this is the way I think about everything. I think about it in business. I think about it in church. I think about it in marriage. What's the irreducible minimum? What's the irreducible minimum to to find success? So I say to him, what's the one thing I, I need to not do and I need to do so that I'm not in constant pain because I'm headed out to Connecticut? And so he told me what to do. So if Jesus were here and he's, and, and I'm looking at him, I say, Jesus, I'm not very smart. I'm from Georgia. Okay. But, but what's the one thing to be successful in life? I just need one thing. 
This is it, gang. This is it. Make the main thing the first thing in your life. And watch what God will do. Watch what he'll do. So Jordan Peterson, anybody here ever listen to Jordan Peterson? Okay. Jordan Peterson made an astounding statement. He's not a Christian. At least I don't think he is. Pretty close. Man, he says some great stuff. Cusses a lot too. But um, anyway, Canadian psychologist wrote the bestseller, national, international bestseller called 12 Rules. I'd encourage you to read it. Encourage your kids to read it. He said this, Seeking first the kingdom of God is the most profound and noble statement ever made to man. And yet the church doesn't do it. It's amazing to me because the kingdom of God is God's total answer to every need in our life. Do you, get, do you realize that 2024 might be a shakable year? Anybody thought about that? It's going to be shaking, man. We're seeing, you know, we've got, you've got a war in Ukraine. You've got a war in the Middle East. You've got an interesting economy. I think we have some kind of an election coming up, maybe in 2024. It's shakable. Don't you want to be unshakable? So Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, I am giving you an unshakable kingdom. I'm not going to get shaken in 2024. My wife and I are not going to get shaken in 2024. And the road at Chapel Hills in Colorado, we're not going to get shaken in 2024 because we're seeking after the unshakable kingdom. And folks, if you don't seek it, it don't come. You have a free will. And if you want to live in a shakable world and be worried about everything all the time, go for it, man. That's what everybody else does. Or you can walk in primarily, because it's not, this is impossible to do it perfectly, but primarily you can walk in a less worry-filled life. You can start living a, an unshakable life. You can start having unshakable health. You can start having unshakable mental health. You can start to stabilize your life if you'll make the main thing your first thing. And I've been testing this for 50 years, and it works. So anybody heard of a guy named Orson Welles? Orson Welles, his dystopian novels and stuff are very famous. He wrote 1984. Here's what he said. Not, definitely not a believer. Probably, I think you could arguably say Orson Welles is the most prolific writer of the 20th century. He said this, Why, here is the most radical proposal ever presented to the mind of man, the proposal to replace the present world order with God's order, the kingdom of God. I don't care how you vote in politics. I don't care what you think about the economy. Here's what I care about. You become a kingdom person, you'll become unshakable, and you'll bring a revolution to this country. You'll make a difference in your school. You'll make a difference in your marriage. You'll make a difference in your life because the kingdom of God is explosive. It's revolutionary. This is revolutionary stuff, folks. Jesus did not come to build a religion. He came to build a revolution. And when he came to the earth, he came to kick out demons. And so when he came, 100 times in Scripture, he spoke about the kingdom of God. It's a number one theme of Jesus is the kingdom of God. So he would come. This was his MO. He'd walk into a village. He'd preach the kingdom of God. He'd proclaim it, and then he'd demonstrate it. He'd proclaim it. He would demonstrate it. He would proclaim it. He would demonstrate it. Guess how he demonstrated it? Kicked out demons. So you guys are in spiritual warfare right now. You're talking warfare. That, that's, that's key. In other words, some of you are packing some growlers. You are. You're demonized, okay? You've got stuff. You've got influence from the enemy, and I'll tell you how to kick them out because I've cast out a lot of demons in my time. I've been in haunted houses. I, oh, I could tell you some stories, okay? But I've cast out a lot of demons. I've cast out demons out of missionaries, okay? So they're, they're pretty crafty, right? So you walk in and you tell a person, look, start seeking the kingdom. They go, what? I'm a missionary, man. Of course I seek the kingdom. No, I'm talking about seriously putting him on the throne of your life. You're, you're going to make Jesus the Lord of your life. I, I don't care about religion or anything. I'm talking about the revolutionary transformation of the kingdom of God. And when they do that, they get set free. Not overnight, not in one week, not in one month, but they have a bring it on attitude that begins to change in them and the enemy starts to run. 
he starts to flee in their life. So men and women, make the main thing the first thing in your life and watch what God will do. It's pretty exciting. So I had this guy, oh my goodness, this was like two and a half years ago. He came in and this is so fun. I love people who haven't been to church in a long time or in this case, never been to church, never been to church, okay? He's uh, 21 or something. So I'm up there and I'm preaching and I said, if you'd like to receive Christ, come forward, come forward. And this kid, 21 year old kid with long hair, blonde hair, comes running down the aisle. He just (laughs) running down the aisle and then comes up on the stage with me. Security goes nuts. I mean, everybody's like scurrying and what's going on? And he comes up and he just goes, oh, and he just starts hugging me. And I'm in the middle of the sermon. Okay, he didn't know that. Okay, it's gonna come later. You know, you come up and you got the person who prays for you and everything and all that. No, he's like, he comes up and he hugs me. And so, I don't know, nine months ago. Oh, well, I forgot. We got it all on film. It's pretty fun. So anyway, um, nine months ago, I'm sitting in the kitchen hanging out with all the staff that clean the church. We've got this maintenance team and everything. And I love these guys. So we're always telling jokes and stuff. We're sitting around hanging out. And so Kenny goes, hey, man, wasn't that cool what happened like two years ago with me and everything? And I went, what are you talking about, man? He said, you don't know? You don't remember? I said, remember what? He said, do you remember there there was a kid who just ran down the aisle and and like grabbed you on the stage and all the security went crazy? I said, yeah. Yeah. And then we prayed to receive him. He said, that was me. I said, what, Kenny? That was you? He's on staff with me now, man. He's on staff with me. I didn't even remember him, okay? Okay? So his life, he was under, and so, uh, so we're sitting there. I go, so tell me your story. I don't know your story. So Pastor Eric, I didn't know his story, you know? So I said, tell me, because these, these guys come on. I don't know everybody that comes sometimes. So anyway, I'm talking to him. And he goes, well, right after, right before that, I started coming to Wholehearted Men. So I came to Wholehearted Men in the breakfast and I thought it was really cool. So maybe I should go to the church where it's at. So he started coming. But he was under a bridge. He was under a bridge doing drugs. And he's sitting there and I had said something about the kingdom of God. And he, uh, he stops. He's under the bridge with all these homeless people because he's homeless. And he goes, this is so dumb. Like, I think I'm better than being under a bridge doing drugs with a bunch of homeless people. Maybe I should stop doing that. I'm going to go to that church. And then he got radically saved, and now he's on staff, and he's getting married, and his girlfriend's probably going to live at our house. I mean, this is a great story. Okay, it's a pretty cool story. Kingdom of God changes everything. He got it. This, this guy, guy got it, man. He got it. Now, listen, guys, this is important. You start seeking the kingdom, you start getting mentally smarter. All the studies show, all the studies show, I'm writing a new book right now called Breakthrough Courage. Nine, see, nine habits to conquer fear. Anyway, in the book, I did a lot of research on this, that when people start believing truth, they start getting smarter. So, so, so that's why the school system has got some work to do, because if you start teaching foolishness, then you create fools. You start, you start building truth into kids, you get truth seekers. Are you a truth seeker? Are you guys truth seekers? I would venture to say 95 to 97% of you in this room are truth seekers or you wouldn't be here under Pastor Eric. That guy's a truth seeker. You guys are getting stability here every time you come by the foundation is laying because Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you. You show me a young man, you show me a young woman who's getting truth, I'll show you a young man or young woman who's getting set free. So you, a lot of you, you got, you're shackled up, you got a lot of false beliefs, a lot of stuff, and it's, 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 it's the way it is. I do too. I still do, okay? And I'm still discovering stuff. But you got some stuff, and you don't understand why you never change. You don't understand why you keep doing that, and you treat people that way, or you get fired from your jobs. And by the way, if you've been fired from a few jobs you know, welcome to reality. But the other side is maybe you should change. Okay, maybe you should maybe look at you instead of blaming them and see, maybe I need to change. Maybe I'm an idiot on some things, okay? So you start getting this plumb line of truth happening in your life and then you go, well, why am I doing that? That's not truth, that's dumb. I learned that from my dad or I learned that from my mom or whatever. I'm gonna change. Well, now... That's 
that's lining up with the kingdom. But then you're seeking the kingdom spiritually, okay? So when you love him with your heart, you've now got the Holy Spirit. So you've got power now to change. You didn't have power before. Some of you aren't saved in this room. Some of you don't have the power to change. You're just gonna, you're just gonna maybe say, I should do, I should change this or make that habit better or whatever. That's fine. It's a good start. But don't you want power? Don't you want power? I mean, I I I I like power. I like power in an engine. I like power on a motorcycle. I, power gets you places. And the Holy Spirit will come upon you and he begins to transform you from the inside out so that it's not just you changing, it's in partnership. It's in partnership with the Spirit of God and he's changing you, okay? So I want to close with this. Two thoughts that I want to leave with you about seeking the king. I want to make it really, really practical. The first one is... And this relates to a men's breakfast. So men's breakfast, we got all these guys out there. We got all age groups. We got some 90-year-old guys. So we have some 90-year-old guys that get up and drive over to the men's breakfast. They never miss, like two of them. They're like, Bleh. I think they're former like commanders or something in the Navy. But they, they come, you know, and they wear their hats about being World War II veterans. And I mean, it's like all kind of they, uh, crazy people come. But then I've got a lot of young people. Like a lot of you in this room, I got a lot of young people too. And the young people are the ones who always come and say, Pastor Steve, what's the one thing I could do to get discipline? I need to get discipline in my life, man. I, I want to have a job. I want to start a company or something like that. And I'll say, one thing. You do this one thing and you'll become disciplined. They go, what? Get up early. Oh, no, I can't do that. No way, man. I said, get up at between 4 and 6 a.m. or it doesn't count. Unless you're working a long job at night, four to, between 4 and 6 a.m., you need to be up and you need to work out, okay? And they go, oh. and, and then they do it, and then they get disciplined and stuff. But here's my, here's my point. My point is not the workout part. My point is this. Get up early. Get out of your bed. Don't stay in your bed. Get out of your bed and do PB and J. Write that down. PB and J. You're not writing it down. Do you realize that if you write something down, 85% retention, 85% retention if you write something down. So take notes. When you come to this service, you should be taking notes. So you remember it. Okay. PB and J does not mean peanut butter and jelly. PB and J means prayer, Bible, and journal. It means prayer, Bible, and journal. That means you get up in the morning and you get your head right. Because you wake up in the morning, your head is messed up. Some of you guys have had weird dreams. Some of you guys are so freaked out over your job and all the stuff that you're going through. And don't look at your phone for an hour. Don't look at your phone for an hour. But open your Bible. Start with John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Just start with John. Just read one chapter. That's all. Read one chapter and take a pen. Y'all, did you guys know what a pen is? It's P-E-N. It's not P-I-N. It's in, and you write with it. You know, there's this thing called ink. It comes through it and everything. Okay. It, it used to be really popular. Okay. They used to actually use feathers and stuff. But anyway, you got this, this thing and God doesn't speak to anybody who doesn't have a pen in his hand. I mean, I see people all the time. They say, I never hear from God. I say, you got a pen in your hand? And they go, why? And I says, because you're going to write down what he says. Well, why would I write down what he says? Because he never says anything. Well, the reason he say anything is you don't have a pen in your hand. If you put a pen in your hand, he knows you're going to write it down. He knows that you're going to try to remember it, and you're actually going to try to change your life. You might hear from God. He, I mean, he's, he's an economic God, and he's looking around at people here at Cornerstone. He goes, now, he's got a pen in his hand. She's got a pen in his hand. He doesn't want to forget about him. I mean, I'm going after that guy. That guy's serious, man. So PB&J, start your day. I'm telling you it works. I've tested this thing for 50 years, and it works. Get up. In the morning, get up early, set your alarm, whatever you need to do, PB and J. Start that way. Get your head right, man. Because if you get your head right, you'll get your heart right. Your heart follows your head. Sometimes your head follows your heart. But the point is, is your head and heart guide you. That's making the main thing the first thing. First thing in the morning. Try it for 30 days. And if you know, after 30 days, if you're not transformed, then you get your money back. Okay. Now, second thing. Walk out the door. So get up in the morning, take care of PB&J, 
walk out. Now, if I had time to explain it, and I don't have a ton of time here, but if we could take the greatest commandment, which is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, your neighbor as yourself, and you took seeking the kingdom of God first. Those are the two key passages of the entire New Testament. If you memorize those and you got to know those, you're on really good ground. You'd be ahead of 90% of the body of Christ, okay? Right there. So let's just take this one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is seeking first the kingdom, okay? That's the getting up in the early. That's getting to know God. I would say that's intimacy with God. That's intimacy with God. But, it, but we tend to think it, some of us do, it just ends there. But then there's this other part to the clause where Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So now you're walking out the door. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I challenge you to make a statement into a legitimate, authentic question and watch what God will do. Instead of saying to your neighbor at work or the person at the grocery store, how are you? And that's a statement. How about if you said, how are you? How are you? It's like my barber. I went to a new barber last week. I had this other one. I'm a cheapskate. So I used to always cheap, always cheap haircutter places. But anyway, I was near a, a, what do you call it? Sports cuts. Y'all have sports cuts out here? Okay. They, they massage your back and everything. It's like I lived in Japan for 10 years. And they, they really massage you, Eric. I mean, they, they get there. I mean, it's not none of these machine stuff. It's like, so I thought, wow, this is cool. So I did it. So I don't know this guy. So I just said, how are you? He goes, I'm fine. No, I said, no, I mean, how are you? He says, I'm fine. I said, really? Everything's just perfect in your life? Then he goes, well, no. And I said, well, it's not perfect in my life either. What's up? He knows he's got to talk to me because I'm going to tip him. Okay, so I, I wasn't born yesterday, right? So we're sitting there, and the dude opens up. Seriously, in 20 minutes, I know probably more than his ex-wife does about his life and everything. But, but I just asked a few questions, you guys, because I care. I was loving my neighbor as I love myself. That's all I was doing. So sometimes I get into these controversies in Colorado Springs and I have groups like Antifa and stuff that pick at me and they, they don't like me very much. But I like Antifa. I like their leaders, okay? So I reach out to them and I say, because they'll write something bad about me in the paper. And I said to this one lady, I said, you know, you're a really good writer. <laughs> you, you know, and you're, you're accurate. I mean, what you said about me is kind of true. You, 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 you took some, you know, you, you went into some places that are different than, but why don't we talk about it? Let's go to coffee. This, we're the United States of America. We're not the divided States of America. Why don't we talk about stuff instead of always being mean to each other? Because loving your neighbor as yourself is that people don't want kingdom correction. They need kingdom collaboration. So we got to love people by talking. And what we do is we label everybody, we put them over here, and then we never get anything worked out. Guess what? I think the kingdom of God is more powerful than the kingdom of man. I actually think the kingdom of God is more powerful than politics. I think the kingdom of God is what changes people's lives. I think the kingdom of God is what changes you from the inside out and makes you a new person. I think the kingdom of God will make you a better businessman. I think the kingdom of God will make you a better parent. I think a kingdom of God will keep you healthier. I'm in better shape now than I was 20 years ago because I'm seeking the kingdom in a deeper way than I was 20 years ago. How about you? You want that? It's a good deal, man. It's a good deal. It's a prescription of Jesus. It's the main thing being the first thing. You start doing that, I'm telling you, give it, give it 30 days and you're going to feel better. You're going to look better. How many of you wives wish your husband looked a little better? <laughs> then say, are you seeking the kingdom first? I'm not going to say it the other way around, but I go after guys, okay? Let's stand. And here's how it all gets started. How you all get started on this is you got to know Jesus. So you start with Jesus. So if you've never given your heart to Christ, then you don't have the power to do this. If you want 
to make the main thing of the universe. It's not the multiverse. You guys know that we don't live in the multiverse? We live in the universe, and Jesus unifies it all. Jesus brings unity to your life. He brings unity to your mental health. He brings unity to your emotional health. He brings unity to your physical health. He brings unity to your spiritual health. We, we've tended to think in the church that it's all about the spiritual. It's not. We're, we're concentric circles. We're very complex, you guys. Right? You guys know that, right? Right? Well, I want, I want whole health. And whole health comes from the whole heart that's seeking the whole gospel, which is the kingdom of God. And God's there for you. So here's how we're going to start. I was a freshman at Georgia, knelt down in a little chapel there, and uh, I was 18, gave my heart to Christ. Everything didn't change overnight, but my mental attitude and my aim changed overnight. And over the years, everything fell into place. So I've tested this stuff. This isn't, this isn't like yesterday stuff. This is like a long time I've been doing this. Okay, so I met my wife who's at UCLA. She's a tri-dale at UCLA. I'm a jock at University of Georgia. We meet smuggling Bibles in China. How do you figure that one out? So you're in for an adventure. You start following Jesus. It's a big adventure, man. You don't even know what God will do. Some of you guys in this room are called to be millionaires. And you're, and you're in a rundown job going absolutely nowhere because you're not seeking the kingdom where he can speak to you and tell you you need to be over here and you're way over there. Some of you in this room are, are, are engineers and you're messing around with stuff that, that is not in your field and you need to change, but you're not going to know unless you hear from God. Because God knows he created you for something on this face, to be on this face this earth to make a difference. You're not here to just exist. You're here to make an impact in people's lives. Some of you are on the other side. You got everything. You got everything you want, but there's something in you that longs for something deeper. You want to change people's lives, but you're caught up in the, tr in the, in the race, man. You're in the American race. And God's saying, look, let me take control. I'll take care of stuff. Quit worrying about that. Watch what I'll do, because I made you for this, but you're over here. So if you've never received Christ, if you've never opened up your heart, that's step one. That's getting Jesus into you and, and letting the kingdom start to live in you. Because the kingdom etymology, etymology in Greek of kingdom of God is the word basilia. Basilia is where we get the word basilica. Basilica is where we get the word castle. You got one throne in one castle of your heart and either you're on it or he's on it. And if you're on it, good luck. That's the best I can say to you, good luck. If he's on it, power, baby, power. Kingdom of God power, the power that kicks demons out, the power that sets the captives free. You know, that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus did not come to be a a religious leader. He came to be a revolutionary leader, and that revolution is about setting the captives free. Now, if you don't want to be set free because you like your captivity, then please stay there by all means. But if you want to be set free, it starts with Jesus. So would all of you guys just bow your heads, and if you'd like to receive Christ, if you'd like to begin the great adventure of knowing the kingdom of God in your life, raise your hand, and I'm going to pray for you. All right, lots of you. Fantastic. Fantastic. Come on. Come on. That's right. Anybody else? Amen. All right. So you guys that raise your hands, I want you just to put your hands down and, close, and you got your eyes closed. I want you to just pray under your breath this prayer that I'm going to pray, very similar to the one I prayed so many years ago. It still works. It's not magical, but you, you listen to my sentence. I'll do one sentence at a time. And if you believe it, then you pray it under your breath to Jesus and he hears your prayer. He hears your prayer and that opens the door. Guys, that opens the door to the kingdom of God in your heart. Lord Jesus, I need you. I want your kingdom to come. I want your will to be done. On earth as it is in heaven, in my heart. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my heart to you. 
come in. Transform me from the inside out. Jesus, I place you on the throne of my heart. I dethrone me. I enthrone you. Give me a passion for the book. Give me a passion for the Bible. Give me a passion for truth. Give me a passion for health from the inside out. In your name we pray. Amen. That's good. That's good. Now, I'm going to, I know I'm a little over time, so please forgive me. Um, Because I know none of you are worried about lunch. That's so great because now you're seeking the kingdom first and everything. Um, That was a joke. Okay. All right. How many of you, though, you know the Lord and you've followed the Lord, but now you know you've been on the throne of your life? Like right now, you're really, really worried and you'd like to, in a sense, kind of reestablish the enthronement of Christ in your life. Would you raise your hand? All right, so many. Okay, let's just pray one more time. And I'm just going to pray this. Lord, every person that raised their hand both times, I pray, Lord, the blessings of the desire and the passion to go after the kingdom to be restored in the the lives of these men and women, that, Father God, they would become kingdom revolutionaries starting in their home, starting in their personal life, starting in their marriage, starting in their family, and then take it to the streets. They would take it out and love people as you love them. They would be the kind of people that proclaim and demonstrate the kingdom with compassion and love and mercy and grace, even to those who they completely disagree with on everything. They still love them. And they're bridge builders, not wall builders. In the name and the blood of Jesus, amen. All right, God bless you guys.